Hi, and welcome to MC Squared. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science-related with the best minds in the field. I'm Vishnu, and today we are meeting with Gerard McCall of Tulane University. Dr. McCall was a co-author of a paper which demonstrated how lasers can be utilized to make one type of material exhibit the properties of another. For example, making an insulator behave like a superconductor. This is an amazing theoretical breakthrough and can be thought of as a sort of quantum alchemy, except it's real science. Welcome, Dr. McCall. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. Before we begin, it's really important for the audience to understand what both a wave function and a Hamiltonian are. Can you explain what these two terms mean? Uh, Yeah, sure. So, uh, let's take the example of kind of how, how we do physics in classical and quantum mechanics kind of respectively. So the idea in physics generally is always that you're trying to kind of predict the motions of objects, whether they're kind of simple particles like electrons or something more complicated, but that you can still mathematically represent as simple. So you might uh, know that in classical physics, you have this thing uh, of Newton's equations, right, that tell you essentially how an object's motion will change in time, how it's going to accelerate. Well, the problem we have in quantum mechanics is that uh, fundamentally you can't kind of know positions of momenta at the same time. So you can't get that kind of classical equation of motion in the uh, in the same way as you would for something like a car, okay? Um, so the way we kind of describe quantum objects is not kind of just directly with their equation of motion, but we have to think about the state they're in. Um, and there are lots of ways of kind of representing this state, but the wave function is one of them. It's something that essentially tells you everything that you can know about a quantum state. And, you know, people argue about whether or not it kind of wave functions are real or not. But the main thing is that it's something where you can kind of follow a formula for getting calculations about what where you expect your quantum system to be or how much momentum you expect it to have on average, let's say. So that's the wave function. And it describes the state of a quantum system. Now, the other ingredient that you need if you want to be able to do physics, you have to understand how the state of your system will evolve with time. It's no good just saying, okay, I've got the state of my system at, say, time one, but I want to know what happens at time two. So I have to have a sense of how it evolves. Uh, And in quantum mechanics, that's what the Hamiltonian achieves. It's essentially uh, the thing that tells you, you know your wave function at instant one, uh, the Hamiltonian will tell you what that wave function is going to evolve into in the next moment. So with these two ingredients, this is everything that you kind of need to do quantum mechanics. From what I can understand, your technology works by using short pulses of lasers to manipulate an atom's electron cloud. Can you explain how lasers can change the trajectory of electrons? Okay, sure. So the first thing I should say is that the, re- the, the research we do is, is what you kind of call theoretical research, right? That it's, it's about um, looking at the possibilities of knowing what our quantum si- how our quantum system should behave uh, and knowing we have some, some kind of control with a laser pulse. When we kind of model it with pen and paper and uh, computer simulations, which are very accurate, what can we do to affect that? So the idea here is that a laser pulse generates uh, or is an electromagnetic field, okay? And when you have something like electrons, they will interact with this field. And uh, what the electromagnetic field will do is it will alter the motion of the electrons depending on the strength uh, of the field and the direction it's pointing in. So in that way, you've got this kind of interaction between photons and electrons where you can kind of, you can control the laser pulse uh, and use that to kind of influence the motion of the electrons in your system. So uh, perhaps, perhaps one of the simple things is it's, it's for the same reason that, you know, if you looked at a circuit, right, and you've got a battery and you know you get currents. So that's the motion of electrons in the wire. And what's kind of pushing them around is an electric field. So in that sense, it's no different from the laser pulse that every time you flick a switch to turn on uh, a circuit, you know, turn on the light, you're completing this circuit that's kind of creating this electric field in the wire that's driving the electrons. I'm sure that different types of pulses affect the electrons differently. Why is it particularly difficult to determine what kind of pulse contributes to a certain change in a group of electrons? 
Uh, that's a great question. And uh, it's to do with uh, something called kind of non-linearity. So uh, if, you've, if you've ever kind of drawn a graph at school, something like y equals x, right? Uh, the thing that you see is that it's a straight line. There's a one-to-one -one thing of if you increase y by 10, x will go up by 10 if it's y equals x. Uh, and there may be some gradient or something, but the idea is that it's a straight line relationship. And that's what you call a linear relationship. And in that kind of, it's very easy on pen and paper to say, you know, if X is something, then Y has to be this. But what we find in quantum mechanics is that, well, the way wave functions evolve is what you might call linear. Um, if we look at the response of electrons to an electromagnetic field, depending on the system, that can actually be highly nonlinear. So it's not necessarily easy to predict what kind of response you'll get out uh, from the electron motion uh, for a given field. You know, it can, it, it, it can change hugely if you only make a tiny change in your field. Uh, this is the kind of thing that has the potential to happen. So it's this non-linearity that can make it difficult to do this stuff. Despite these issues, you have been able to develop an effective theoretical framework. This framework allows you to come up with a really good approximation of which type of pulse contributes to a specific change in a group of electrons. What is your method and how does it mitigate the challenge posed by a complex system? So uh, a lot of this, there's, there's two elements to this, you might say. So as, as, as we said before, there's this idea of the Hamiltonian that evolves your wave function. And the Hamiltonian will contain your uh, electromagnetic field that you control, what you call the control field. And so that comes into, um, the control field comes into evolving the wave function like that, because the Hamiltonian is what's evolving the wave function and what's the Hamiltonian is being determined by your electromagnetic control field. So there is a kind of relationship that you can write down on paper that you can't solve between your control field, the thing that, you know, you're using the, the laser pulse that you're using to manipulate the electrons, on one side of your equation and the kind of the response of the electrons, the measurement, if you like, that you're uh, on the other side of the equation. There's a relationship between those two things that's, um, that you can't kind of solve apart from the simplest of cases. But what you can do is kind of invert your equation to get an expression for the control field in terms of things you can measure. Uh, again, it's something that's kind of too difficult to be solved on pen and paper, but there are uh, certain things you can do to kind of tell you whether or not something is possible. So we used uh, some techniques to kind of analyze whether this expression for our control field uh, was achievable or not. And so by doing that, we were able to say, you know, precisely when it would be possible to kind of generate the sort of electronic currents we'd want, you know, whether a field can do that. And if we know a field can do it, and it avoids these kind of other problems, that's when we can kind of put it on to a computer to solve it. So it's all about, in some sense, just inverting an equation that's well known, but then doing some analysis on that to say whether or not this equation has a solution. And if it has a solution, then we can put it onto a computer to simulate it. And once we've got that kind of simulated thing, uh, you know, we can check it works and all of this stuff. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's the method in the broadest strokes. So basically, you first determine what change you want in the system, and then you choose the laser pulse? Yes, that's precisely it. That you, you actually, uh, you think about, uh, you kind of pre-specify, this is the response I want, and you put that into the equation uh, to get out what the control field should be. Um, but the trick is that, uh, because of this non-linearity, you need a technique for knowing whether or not, before you kind of start doing it, um, before you put it in the simulation, whether or not it's actually going to be possible to generate this sort of response. Uh, is there any field that can generate the response I want and that I'm putting into the equation? Okay. How does changing the trajectory of the electron cloud affect the properties of the substance? So uh, when we talk about changing the uh, trajectories. It's not specifically the kind of the physical trajectory the electron clouds are taking. It's the trajectory of the property we're trying to change, you see. So all of the properties um, of the electron cloud 
you know, are functions of the wave function, right? So if we, if it, uh, so we find out first of all what the kind of on paper relationship is between the property we want to alter and the control field is before doing this inversion. So I, I, I know it can kind of sound a little bit abstract when we talk about trajectories, but we're sort of going directly to, okay, what is the trajectory of the property? So in time and uh, in time. So yeah, it's, it's, it's language that is a little bit kind of more abstract. Um, that when we're doing these control equations, we're not necessarily trying to directly control the physical motion of the electron. Uh, direct, we will kind of affect that, but that's a second order effect. That we're going directly to the equation that relates the control field to whatever property we're interested in. For example, uh, you know the the electronic current rather than the physical, uh, the direct motion of the electron cloud. Using your method, it becomes possible to turn an insulating material into not only a conducting one, but a superconducting one. What is the fundamental difference between an insulator and a conductor, and how can you use lasers to transform the former into the latter? Okay, great question. Um, so, the difference between a conductor and an insulator, in some sense it, it sounds almost trivial that, you know, conductors conduct and insulators don't. But the quantum mechanical explanation for this is that materials, uh, because it's quantum, uh, all the electrons, there are discrete energy levels that they live in. And so when you leave a material on its own, uh, it's in its ground state, which means that it's at the lowest energy state it can be. And so what that means is that uh, all of the electrons are kind of in the lowest level they can occupy. They don't like being in the same energy level uh, for the system, but they are kind of all occupying the lowest energy levels they can. Now, when you give that system a kick with an electromagnetic field, the question is, are there other states that the electrons can kind of reach without expending any energy? So, you know, does that kick allow them to move into new states where they can kind of move around and they're not locked into place by uh, the exclusion principle? And the answer is that if they can access uh, states that there's kind of, there's no energy gap between the ones they occupy and the ones they don't, then they can, then the electric field will push them there and they're allowed to kind of move around freely. They're conducting that. So that's that's the idea that um, a conductor is one where if you kind of give the system a little kick, the electrons can move into new states very easily that let them move uh, that let them kind of physically move around. Whereas in an insulator, there's what you call a, a band gap or an energy gap between the kind of the occupied states the electrons are in and the next state that they could possibly occupy because it's quantum and everything has to be discrete. And this gap means that even if you're kind of kicking something with an electric field, uh, it's not getting a response because there's nowhere for the electrons to go. They don't, you're not giving them enough energy to get over this gap into new state. So what are the overall implications of this technology? What avenues does it open up that were previously blocked? Um, so that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think there, there are kind of there are a lot of potential applications for this um, in terms of being able to control physical systems is kind of uh, the the future of kind of quantum physics in some sense that uh, it's sometimes said we're in the middle of a second quantum revolution uh, and while the first one was about understanding the kind of the rules of the quantum world this new one is going to be about using that and kind of abusing those rules to make quantum technologies that where we can actually manipulate quantum states to do things that we couldn't classically. Uh, so the idea of kind of being able to have a relationship between um, the state or not necessarily the states, but the outputs that you want to observe and what control fields you need is a kind of really useful way for kind of engineering certain responses. Um, it could be it could be helpful in uh, what you call this field of neuromorphic computing of using uh, uh, reservoirs of atoms uh, and uh, controlling them and using their outputs as what you might think of as a computation. You can actually make single atoms do uh, computing with this kind of control method. Uh, so that's something we're working on now. Again, there's a possibility of kind of using this to design special kind of optically induced superconductors. 
And, and if you could get a high temperature version of that, that's kind of optically induced, that would be tremendously useful. You could kind of, you could cut the size of engines and ships by uh, a factor of four. It would revolutionize the world if you could get kind of really high TC superconductors working effectively. Um, but, you know, that, that, that's kind of, uh, we're, we're kind of working towards having a proper theoretical model for how to do that. And then kind of experiments will come after that. So it's all, it's all kind of long time in the future in that regard. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's more I could uh, add to that, but I think I'd just be continuing to ramble on at this point. <laughs> and that concludes this episode of MC Squared. Huge thanks to Dr. McCall for agreeing to be on the podcast. Additionally, if you enjoyed this, be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.